Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Are you a lover of money? That's not a tongue-in-cheek question. It's a serious consideration for the disciples of Jesus. Are you a lover of money? What role does money play in your life? Our text today forces us to ask this question. So today begins the first of four weeks where we'll have inserts in our bulletin regarding stewardship. And stewardship contains the, destru- the instructions of disciples about what they are to do with the things God gives them. And I'm sorry to inform you, but money is one of those things. It's always a difficult topic for people, especially in the church. Why does the church care so much about my money? Or some form of that question often rises unbidden in our hearts as soon as the subject is broached. Well, there are some practical answers to that question. Churches aren't for-profit organizations. We don't generate a product we can sell for money. So all the things that we're able to do are based on the offering of God's people. But beyond that, I would like to, to put to you that this isn't really a good question for the disciple to ask themselves. The question that we should be asking ourselves isn't, why does the church care so much about my money? but one that is more to the point and will answer that question anyways, which is, why does Jesus care so much about money? As I asked the children in the children's message, does Jesus need your money? I don't think so. That sort of comes with the territory of being God. You don't need anything. And if He wanted money, He could just make it, or He could take it. So why does Jesus care so much about money? That's a much better question for us to ask. After all, our Lord is the source of our instruction on how to live a godly life as a disciple of Jesus. So if Jesus is talking about money, we should be asking ourselves why He's doing that. And today in our Bible reading is probably one of the more famous quotes in the Scriptures from verse 13 about money. I'll read it one more time. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Well, this verse highlights the main concern that Jesus has about money for His disciples. It's His main concern about money for you, and it has to do with that which you place your hope and your trust in. To take care of you. So Jesus, in His teaching today, turns to His disciples. Luke is very intentional about identifying the audience to which Jesus is speaking. So He just got done doing the lost sheep and the lost coin and then the prodigal son, and that was addressed to the gathering of everyone because the focus of those stories was on how God feels about those who are lost. And since everyone is lost, He wants everyone to hear that. But now he turns to his disciples, and here we're getting some insight into some of the catechesis that Jesus is doing with his disciples. So he's teaching them about, now that you are following me, how do you view money? What role does it play in your life? So he tells a parable. In the parable, there's a certain rich man And this rich man is informed, charges are brought to him by someone that isn't identified, that the steward of his money, the manager of his money, is wasting his possessions. This would be a grave violation of the agreement because the rich man has hired the manager, he's given him charge of his finances in order to carry them out the way that the rich man instructs. But he's not doing that. So what happens? Well, he gets fired. The manager says, what is this I hear about you? 
do an accounting of your books and then turn them into me, you're out of a job. Fired. Oh, man. If you've ever been fired from a job, let go from a job, and then your future seems uncertain. No paycheck. Don't know what to do. Worried about every possible eventuality. What if I get sick? What if the car breaks down? What if, what if, what if? Well, this manager's no exception. He starts to consider what his options are. So first he thinks, well, I could... I've got, I'm alive, I have a body, maybe I can do manual labor, but no, I'm, I'm not strong enough to dig, I can't do that. I could beg, but I'm too ashamed to beg. So what option is left to me? And he comes up with an idea. He says, ah, I know what I will do. I'll go to the people who owe my master a debt, and I'll forgive part of their debt, so that when I am out they'll owe me a favor. They'll receive me as a friend. So he does that. He gets a couple of the people that owe the master a debt, and he deals with them one by one. Word maybe hasn't gotten around the compound that he's on the outs with the master of the house yet. And so he quickly wants to get this done. So he meets with a guy who says, I owe the master 100 measures of oil. The, uh, the term for that is baths of oil, which is about eight to nine gallons. So this guy owes 800 to 900 gallons of oil to the master, pretty significant debt. And what does the steward do? He says, all right, real quickly, erase that and write 50. It's a lot of oil. Then the next guy comes up and he owes 100 measures of wheat, 100 bushels of wheat. It's a lot of wheat. Does the same thing. Take that and write 80. And we actually know from the general uh, amount of wealth associated with each of those measurements, that's about the same amount. It's a significant amount of money. But then something weird happens, and this is where this parable gets a little tricky and it's hard to understand. It says that the master commends the unrighteous steward for his shrewdness. And it gets tricky because we're wondering, is the master commending him for his dishonesty, for doing this thing that essentially he stole from his master? He didn't have the authority to do what he did. And yet, because he knows he's on his way out, he's trying to make a little nest for himself for a soft landing. And the master commends his shrewdness. Now, it's important that we pay attention to the words there. He's not commending his unrighteous behavior but he's commending his shrewdness. It's almost like, oh, well, didn't have a lot of options. Nice choice, right? And then we get to the teaching of Jesus in verse 9. Uh, right before verse 9, he says, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Well, what are the disciples, what are they taking away from this? Well, the takeaway for this for the disciples is that they are to be shrewd. Not shrewd in the way the unrighteous manager is, and Jesus is going to expound on that, but to copy their shrewdness and the way they deal with one another. After all, even though you would say that it's wrong, the approach the steward took certainly served him well in the situation that he found himself in. He was quite shrewd in dealing with his predicament. So the disciples are supposed to be shrewd as the steward was for himself, but shrewd in the way that God wants us to serve Him as sons of light. And there's a slight rebuke in there too. He says, that we're not quite as good at that. We're not quite as shrewd when it comes to God's things as we are with what we perceive to be our own. So now we get to the real catechesis section of the text. And Jesus continues on. He says, if you're faithful in a very little, you'll also be faithful in much. If you're dishonest in little, you will be dishonest in much. So that verse right there rules out the idea that Jesus is commending the manager for his dishonest 
use of his master's funds. Clearly, he's saying that that isn't the case. Because then he goes on and says, If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? Now, a couple of things here. What does all this mean? It's kind of confusing. Well, unrighteous wealth is the wealth of the world. doesn't mean it was gained through unrighteous means, but that the, wor- the worldly wealth cannot buy you righteousness. There are certain limits to what it can do and the role it's meant to play in the life of the disciple. It's not for righteousness. So why does Jesus say this? Well, He says this to make a connection for His disciples, that it turns out you can't have this is my Jesus world over here, and this is my money world over here, and there's no connection between them. As long as I do this stuff over here, it doesn't have to change anything that I do over here. He's making a connection for them between the true riches and the unrighteous wealth, right? Which, of course, brings us back to our question. Why does Jesus care about that? And that brings us to the verse that started this whole thing. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus cares about money, and by extension, the church cares about money because we care about your heart what you are putting your hope and trust in, what you are obeying. You can see from the example of the unrighteous steward, although he is shrewd, he is shrewd in service to money. He behaves shrewdly in order to make sure that the security of his future is set, not by trusting in God, but by trusting in his ability to build this wealth nest for himself. And Jesus is saying that's not what he's calling his disciples to. Faithful in little, faithful in much. Dishonest in little, dishonest in much. If you are unfaithful with unrighteous wealth, who then will give you the true riches? This is why, dear friends in Christ, we're talking about money today. Because God knows, Jesus isn't naive, He knows how money works. He knows that it can, and often does, compete for your allegiance, an allegiance that should only belong to Him. And the reason He cares about that so deeply is because it does not deliver. Remember in verse 9, he says, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, not if it fails, but when it fails, your Lord Jesus does not wish for you to put your hope and security in something that can't live up to the task. He wants you to put your hope and security in Him because He does live up to the task. There are things money can't buy. Righteousness, favor from God, love of another human being. And when you die, it does nothing for you. It doesn't address your death. It doesn't serve you after you're dead. Right? We learn this from the parable of the rich fool. It doesn't do you any better to have giant barns of stored wealth when your soul is required of you. So Jesus cares about money because He cares about your heart. So if Jesus then, by extension of that, is commending us to be shrewd, as shrewd as this steward He gave us an example of, what is He really saying? Because He's not commending the unrighteous behavior, so what should that mean for a disciple? So the steward gives us an example of how to be shrewd as a son of the world, a son of this age. But how are we to be shrewd as sons of light, as followers of Jesus, as His disciples? Well, our shrewdness is no longer in maintaining 
our hope and security through the means of unrighteous wealth. We no longer hope in those things. I mean, that would have been the default in the ancient world, and in many ways it still is today, right? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you sit down to plan about the future? Nobody has to tell you to think about it. You don't have to convince yourself. You don't have to make a note to remind yourself. Often the first thing that pops in your head is money. Can we afford to fix this? Can I afford to get a new car? How much money are we going to make in the next couple of months, right? All those sorts of things. And that's not bad in and of itself. Part of our shrewdness, as we'll see, is to use those things wisely. But now we've been given a new orientation, a new lens by which we are to be shrewd. So the first thing is we recognize what the steward didn't, that we are in fact stewards. You'll notice that what got the steward in trouble were all the actions that he took which he had no authority to do on his own. He didn't have the authority to forgive debts owed to the master, and he certainly didn't have the authority to waste the possessions as the charges were brought against him. That's why he got fired. Now that we are followers of Jesus, we can recognize that we're stewards, that the wealth that we have, as I said to the children, the money and all the goods and blessings of this world, find their source in God. He's given each of those things to us. We're stewards. They belong to Him, not to us, and He's given us to care for them and use them in certain ways. So, with this new lens, what does Jesus tell us to do? Well, the steward lends expecting something in return. Jesus says, lend expecting nothing in return. You can see how small change, but worlds apart, the unrighteous steward and the sons of this age, why the heck would I do that? That's not a good investment. That's a waste of my money. And yet, that's what Christ calls us to do. Because we know now that money fails that our hope isn't in the wealth of this world, the unrighteous wealth, but in the true riches. So what does this look like for us? Well, since we don't serve money but God, we do our best to do what He says when it comes to money. We, be, we do our best to be faithful to our job as steward and be shrewd in that task. We give alms to the poor who can't pay us back. We give back to God a portion of what He's given to us in recognition that all things that we have come from Him. And we don't trust in money to secure our future. We trust in God. This is where true riches lie. Now, you might be thinking at this point, this seems like a raw deal. You said it wasn't really about getting my money, but that's still a little bit what it sounds like. And what am I getting in return? Right? All of those questions are fostered by our sinful heart, which is calling us to behave as sons of this world. But you do get something in return. Not because you do these things, but God does intend to give you the true riches, as He calls it here in our gospel text. So why do you give 10% to the church? Why do you give alms to the poor? Because these actions denote a trust in God, they're done in faith, and they're a reminder to us that we don't put our hope in money. After all, that's the way we are. We know that day in and day out, we have to continually be reminded through God's Word where our hope, our salvation, and our deliverance lies. Not in money, not in wealth, but in Christ our Savior. So we, use these, we do these actions because they use money in such a way that points to, for ourselves, our hope in Christ, and it bears witness to others. Where are the true riches? Maybe they don't know any of the details, but they see this person behaving rather oddly with their money. Why are you doing things with your money the way that no one in the world does? Opportunity to tell them about the true riches of Jesus. And what are those true riches? God gives you the forgiveness of sins, salvation, and eternal life that swallows up death forever. What does money give you if it's your master? Money in the place of God gives the illusion of security. It gives the ability to buy things that decay or get destroyed or lost. 
and it remains completely silent and useless in the face of death. Why does Jesus care about money? He doesn't want that for you. He wants grace, forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation forever. So, dear friends in Christ, come. Today you are invited to receive these true riches of God. In service to Him, be shrewd in the use of your money. Guard your hearts against its ability to corrupt you away from God, to place your trust and hope in that which will ultimately fail you. Use it to the best of your ability and under His grace, how He commands. For with Him are the true riches. Riches that cannot be destroyed. Riches that do protect you from every eventuality, regardless of what our world says. And that conquer death and bring you to life everlasting. That is what our Lord desires for you. That is what His gifts, His true riches bring. And guess what? They don't cost anything. You don't need any money to get these riches. They can't be bought. They are given freely as a gift of grace today here for you. In the name of Jesus, amen.